John Oldman, a college history professor, is packing his truck with moving boxes. His colleagues from the faculty pay him an unexpected visit to bid him farewell. We meet John's colleagues, the witty biologist Harry, the keen observer anthropologist Dan, the devout Christian art history professor Edith, the lovestruck historian Sandy, and the archaeologist Art, who arrives on his motorcycle with his student-turned-lover, Linda, as his companion. The group brings along food and drinks, intending to throw a going-away party for John. These friends have shared the last ten years with him, and they're a bit upset that he's all packed up and ready to leave without a proper farewell. John apologizes for his hasty departure, citing his dislike for lengthy goodbyes. One by one, they start gently probing John about his sudden decision to leave. John offers the familiar explanation of having itchy feet, but none of them are convinced. Dan and Harry both express concerns about potential legal issues John might be hiding, despite his repeated assurances to the contrary. Amid Harry's teasing, Dan's curiosity, and his colleagues' prodding, John decides to share the truth, expecting them to find it unbelievable. Earlier, Edith found what seemed to be a genuine Van Gogh painting in John's truck, and Dan found a prehistoric tool dating back to the Magdalenian era in John's house. John tells Edith that the Van Gogh painting was a gift from Vincent Van Gogh himself, while he casually brushes off the prehistoric artifact as a lucky thrift store find. As John lays out his extraordinary story, explaining that he is a 14,000-year-old man from the Magdalenian era and that he personally knew the artist responsible for the famous prehistoric cave paintings of Lascaux in ancient France, the group's emotions range from skepticism and dismay to genuine curiosity and even a touch of anger. When they inquire if he retains awareness from his days as a caveman, John explains that his knowledge has expanded in tandem with humanity's collective knowledge. Many of the terms used today to describe prehistoric concepts had no names or definitions during his time. His awareness of his own past is akin to the vague memories a child might have before learning to talk or read. However, one thing he was always conscious of was that he was fundamentally different from those around him. While the members of his native tribe aged and eventually passed away, he did not. He estimated that he ceased aging at approximately 35 years old, though accurate timekeeping or calendars were non-existent. For the sake of his own safety, he had no choice but to part ways with his tribe, as they believed him to be some sort of energy vampire, draining their life force to extend his own. Harry excitedly proclaims that this could be the origin of the vampire myth. John casually mentions that for the majority of his 14,000 years, he's lived in obscurity, relocating every decade or so to avoid people noticing his lack of aging. Questions begin to surface about whether John possesses some form of superhuman abilities. Harry decides to test John's reflexes by attempting to surprise him from behind, but he finds himself swiftly tossed onto his back within seconds. John reiterates that he's not superhuman, just an ordinary man with 14,000 years of practice. Harry speculates that John might have a unique mutation that enables his cells to renew perfectly, devoid of the usual defects that accumulate during the aging process. While the notion of a 14,000-year-old man may seem fantastic, Dan reasons that nothing about it is inherently impossible. Sandy observes that John always stays near a fireplace, he comments that it's a habit he's retained from his primitive days. When questioned about whether he had encountered famous historical figures, John readily shares stories of nearly joining Columbus crew and other close encounters with history. He also mentions that around 500 BC, he journeyed east, spending time in India where he crossed paths with the wisest individual he would ever encounter, Gautama Buddha. John recounts a period of studying with the Buddha, before his inherent nature once again compelled him to move on. While Dan, Harry, and Sandy are captivated by John's narrative, archaeologist Art becomes increasingly indignant, believing that their friend is playing a prank on them. Edith shares the same sentiment, feeling as though John is toying with their emotions by weaving this intricate and seemingly impossible tale. Eventually, Art reaches his breaking point and quietly steps away to make a phone call. With the mention of Buddha, a loaded question emerges, one that even John hesitates to answer, has he ever been a famous historical figure himself? Initially, John tries to dodge the question but is pushed by Harry to reveal the truth. Reluctantly, John starts to tell a story of his time in the Middle East around 2000 years ago. 
he attempted to share teachings similar to Buddha's with willing students. These ideas led to conflict with the Roman government and religious orthodoxy. Edith is appalled by the idea that John might be suggesting he was Jesus. John counters by stating that he never claimed to be a savior, that title was given to him. Regarding his resurrection, John explains that he used meditation techniques to slow his vital signs and fake his death during the crucifixion. His hands were bound to the cross, not nailed, so he wasn't mortally wounded. He awoke in his crypt and slipped away, unaware that he was being watched. His departure sparked the resurrection story. Harry humorously notes that Jesus has been depicted in various ways over the years, and now, it turns out he was a caveman. A deeply offended Edith expresses her dismay, questioning who else John will pretend to be next, whether it's Solomon, Elvis, or Jack the Ripper. John attempts to calm Edith, but she remains unconvinced, thinking the story is a cruel joke targeting her beliefs. She asks Harry to take her home, but Harry is eager to hear more. Edith bitterly inquires if John randomly selected the name Jesus, and he earnestly explains that his name has always been something resembling John. However, later Hebrew translations of his story used the name Yeshua, also known as Joshua, which eventually transformed into the Latin translation as Jesus. The group is interrupted by the arrival of university psychologist, Dr. Will Gruber, whom Art had called earlier. Initially, a curious Will indulges John's story, seeing how far John will take his intricate delusional narrative before admitting it's all a hoax. As the conversation continues, Gruber delves into a more personal aspect, exploring if John's tale is linked to his father's abandonment or has deeper Freudian roots. John responds by explaining that he lacks real memories of a father, only recalling a vague figure, perhaps an older brother, in his dim recollections. Gruber makes a disturbing suggestion, wondering what would happen if he were to take out his gun and shoot this supposedly immortal man. John tries to defuse the situation by stating that Gruber would be guilty of murder, as John never claimed invulnerability. However, before Gruber can test his theory, he angrily storms off. Harry informs John that Gruber had just lost his wife to cancer the day before, explaining his emotional state. John rushes after Gruber and asks for his gun, fearing that he might be contemplating suicide. He then returns later after calming his head. Realizing that things have gone too far, John confesses that it was all an elaborate hoax, a story designed to entertain and confound them, tailored to their respective fields of anthropology, archaeology, biology, and history. Edith is reduced to tears by the revelation, and John humbly asks for their forgiveness. The group's bond proves stronger than their anger at being pranked, and they forgive him. As they prepare to leave for the night, John accompanies them outside, where each of them hugs John and wishes him well on his journey. Gruber however, stays, still contemplating on John's story. Sandy confides in John that she believes his story. She even notices that John is currently using a pun as his last name, John, old man. He acknowledges that he has often used puns as last names, mentioning a time when he lived in Boston and adopted the name, John T. Party, for the Boston Tea Party reference. Gruber overhears their conversation on his way back to the front doorway, and asks if John is the same John Party who left his wife and young son in Boston many years ago. He remembers his father having a beard, which John has since shaved. John immediately realizes that Dr. Will Gruber is, indeed, his long-abandoned young son, Willie. He hugs Dr. Gruber in a loving paternal gesture, noting that chilly Willie never liked the cold. As they go back inside, Gruber suffers a fatal heart attack. Sandy quickly calls 911, and paramedics arrive, but they are unable to save him. As the paramedics take his son's body away, a despondent John completes his packing and climbs inside the truck, ready to leave. Sandy remains standing in his driveway, unable to have a future together with him due to his immortality. However, John stops the truck, taking a chance, and she gets inside. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss a new release. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.